Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Hi, this is Michael Mullaney. How are you? Good. Good. Um, welcome to our seminar on light tackle and fly fishing for Cape Cod. And hopefully we'll all talk today and we'll learn from each other. Um, I started my fly fishing career on the Delaware River in New Hope, Pennsylvania. I had a little shop there uh, in the 90s. And I learned to fly fish at the wing dam. At, uh, and Lambert Hill is on the New Jersey side and New Hope is on the Pennsylvania side. So all different species of fish came up to migrate every season, the shad, the herring, the striped bass, um, large mouth, small mouth, pickerel. So I kind of honed my skills there. Then I met a girl skiing out in Killington and we got together and I sold my house to New Hope and then I opened a shop out in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And so Greenfield was really good because it's a trout fishery. And in Greenfield, you have the Miller's River, the Green River, the Connecticut River, and the Deerfield all merging as one. And it's the mountain part of Massachusetts. So I think that's fascinating because in two or three hours, we can have a trout fishing experience in our mountains in Massachusetts, and then take a drive to the Cape and we're into the stripers and the tuna and the saltwater and all that stuff. Uh, which is really, really advantageous for people that are interested in that. Um, I wrote two journals. The one journal is uh, from 2000 to 2010. And what that encompasses is my experience from New Hope to Cape Cod and to Greenfield. Then I, then I wrote a second journal, which uh, covers Cape Cod. Um, the first journal is sort of a, uh, a book format. And my second journal is a photo montage of some of the experiences uh, on Cape uh, over those years. Uh, some of the fun, other fun things that we did, um, and I always say we, because it's not just me, it's um, all the different fishing guides that I've known, I've got to know over the years, and their charter boats that are in all the harbors on the Cape. We have guys that are down in Falmouth in Buzzards Bay. Um, they come this way to Hyannis, to Seward Harbor on the north side, Barnes Harbor, Walk Harbor, Camden, Provincetown, Chatham, Sacramento, Harborsport, all that. So over the years, right now in the Traveling Angler Project, there's 18 charter captains that we, uh, everybody does a little bit different. Um, but what I like to do, I like to be on the flats boats. I like to sight fish for stripers. Um, I like to fish for them when they come up into the estuaries. And this time of year, the stripers are just arriving. They're facing the herring. Uh, right up into the ponds, you know, right, right all the way up the estuaries. And we're, we're in Osterville right now. We've got beautiful harbor, two harbors here, the east and the west. And then we have the Centerville River, um, all viable places right now to catch stripers right here in your neighborhood, right in, right in Osterville. So the south side from Osterville all the way to Falmouth, and then up into, uh, you know, at the mouth of the canal on our side, this is the time of year um, that you're going to have the best success to catch a striper um, all on the south side. You know, New Seabury, and then to here, Hyannis, Yarmouth, uh, Harwich, all the way to Chatham, this is the time. Um, we have the squid coming in about another th uh, three weeks. That'll be in Nantucket Sound. That brings the bigger bass in and the, and the bluefish. And, but the herring, they're chasing the herring. Uh, they, 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 uh, they love to eat different types of things. Some of the forage that the stripers go after are the, the peanut bunker, they go after the pogies, they go after uh, the sand eels, little sand eels. They also go after um, the herring, they go after squid. They'll also root around in one or two feet of water. And what they'll do is they'll root around and they'll act like bonefish, uh, Pleasant Bay, down in Monomoy, all the way down the Monomoy Island. And they'll root around and their and their tails will stick up and they'll go after um, all kinds of uh, stuff that's under the sand, including like these little sand crabs that we have, they're called like sea lice or something. And then when the waves hit, like, you'll see the seagulls down, the stripers will feed on that too. Uh, the, the stripers will feed on crabs, little, little uh, green crabs or blue crabs uh, as well. And so, uh, that's a little intro. Are you? Do you guys? Um, are you guys all go fishing a lot? Or are you just learning? Or just learning. you guys are all just learning? Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. You want to go around the room? Well, what's your What's your name, sir? Lee. Lee. Yeah. Rose. Hi, Rose. Anna. Hi, Anna. Hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. Janet. Hi, Janet. Okay, great. Um, have you guys fished at all? I mean, have you you you? So you have you have a rod and a reel, and you've gotten out there and. Okay. Only I've only done it in Colorado. You did in Colorado. Never here. So you're into the river type of stuff, more mostly. Yeah, or even go out in the lake, like with the mountains around. Gotcha. Put the waders on and go out. Nice. But not around here. I haven't done it. Okay. I mean, I'd like to. But... All right. Well, it's kind of cool because you you have been lake fishing, and we have a lot of ponds on the Cape. Yeah. And when we think of our ponds, we have to think of that's part of our ecosystem. So our ecosystem, everything happens from the ponds out and then from the ocean back in. So the species of fish will merge together through the estuaries mm -hmm. and the herring will come up the, uh, the ladders. There's 30 or 40, uh, I think there's 34 herring runs on the Cape right now. Very important because the herring spawn, lay their eggs in the pond and then they'll, they'll, they'll go back out to the ocean. And then all summer long, the little herring fry Will grow in the ponds, and that's what the largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, the trout, pickerel, all that stuff are eating that stuff. But the stripers, as as those little juveniles go back out, the stripers will open for them too, and all sides of the cave, including the canal. So the herring runs are everywhere, and they're everywhere in Rhode Island. They're everywhere in South Coast Massachusetts, North Coast New Hampshire. Okay, so the stripers um, is predominantly what we fish for on the Cape, and I think the stripers are, are iconic for light tackle fishing. You know, everybody wants to catch their striper. The stripers migrate, though they, in the winter, they go down to the Chesapeake River, they'll go down to North Carolina, and they'll spawn up Potomac, the Roanoke River, the Delaware River, the Hudson River, okay, all the, the Connecticut River. The stripers go into these freshwater rivers, and that's where they lay their eggs. And then they come out into the ocean in the, in the uh, when when the temperatures are start to rise and it's proper. Right now, the migration of the stripers predominantly are just in Rhode Island, just south of Rhode Island. Uh, the bulk of our stripers are are, are there right now, um, and they're they're he, the, the early ones are here now as well. Uh, the we call them the scouts. I did bring a bunch of lures uh, to show you guys um, that we use for striper fishing and uh, I bought a striper rod. Um, I like the nine foot, um, you, can, you can take it if you want, just check it out and feel the balance point. Mm -hmm. That's a nine foot is what you want to start striper fishing with. You can pass it around. Now, me. You need that length. Why? I, I think that's the most popular for surf casting. Sure. Now, if I'm going to oh. be, yeah, if I'm going to be in the ponds, I'm going to go a little lighter. But that, but that setup I brought right this now. This is for surf. Um, and estuary, and jetties, and jetties. So it's it's almost like it's very light for stripers, mm -hmm. but that you can get a good cast out of that. And I use light light line too. My line is only 15 or 17 pound test. You don't have to have thick line uh, to catch stripers with. But you're saying in a pond you could go a little short. Yeah, I'm going to go a lot. I bought a bunch of pond stuff with me, uh, but what, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit on the ponds. I like to talk about the ponds a lot because, again, it, 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 if you understand the ponds and the estuary, you'll understand. Now, see when I go with my finger like this, see how balanced that, this is called a balanced outfit. So I try to teach everybody. So whenever you go to the store and you're looking for reels and your rod, and if I'm, I'm holding this with one finger and it's balanced. So I can just pick it up and see how I'm feeling, I'm feeling it. it feel, this feels good for me. Mm -hmm. And see how this, this rod, it's it's pretty stiff, you know, and I like it because I'm going to make my cast. And that's what I'm doing. So I feel comfortable with this in my body. Um, I've got a, a nice handle here for, for stripers to make my cast. So that's a little bit, a um, little bit on, on, on surf casting. Um, I'm going to put a YouTube clip up real quick on one of our jetties before I go into the photo montage. And so 
what I just did with the, with the cash, you'll see it in a video. Uh, video. Um, and, and then this jetty's in Hyannis, by the way. Um, okay, there's. All right. So I got a bright pink on, and I'm just going to make my cast straight out. And this is how you work this logo. So I'm going to dance it. I can see if you guys can see it. See it coming in as I bring it back in. I'll go left and right, and I got that bright logo, the jig, a quarter ounce jig head on it. There it is. See how it just dances in the water, and then I pick it up. That's all that there is to it. The fishing is logo. All right, so slugo you're like what the heck is a slugo yeah <laughs> all right so a slugo is a soft plastic oh no i'm still on YouTube. let me get off YouTube. <laughs> okay so a slugo is a soft plastic uh, presentation and let's start with the lures because we'll start with soft plastic so everybody here take take one of these and grab them and they are plastic and the jig, the jig head is on is on the front okay and so jig head. yeah the jig head come in different sizes uh they can one eighth ounce three quarters ounce one half ounce. what's that's, the jig on the front yeah we'll, we'll show it to you in a second so oh, that's okay. that's the magic in the slugo so everybody see the slugo this is like wow what's a slugo a slugo is a sand eel and these sand eel. these sand eel, yeah they, they bury themselves in the sand and when the tide rips in and out they need to come out and eat the phytoplankton yeah. to survive. So when they're eating the phytoplankton, that's when the game species of fish are going to feed on them. This pound for pound in this color, the natural color, is my favorite lure on the cake for striped bass. It's because they they love sand eels. What is that? Like a silicon rubber or something? Yeah, like that? it's a little plastic. But here's yeah. the trick. Uh, let me have one of those jig heads here. Okay, so the head of the jig. Oh no, we need the. Who's got one of the yeah, jig heads? Yeah. Um, All right, so that you can rig these two different ways, three different ways actually. So this has that weight on the front, right? Oh. Now, if I pull the jig head off, all right, I've got this thing, right? So here's the jig. So what you have to do is you have to measure, every hook has the eye on the front, it's the shank here, the bend, and, this, um, and then the point, okay? So those are the four parts of any hook and they come little and big and you have to, pick your hooks that you feel comfortable with. But when I take my sluggo, I have to bite the head off of, of the sluggo, and then I match that. Okay, so I have to slide the soft plastic up the shank of the hook. See how I'm doing it? And then I have videos we can we can put these on if we later, a little bit later on, or we, we can show it again. But there it goes, and now the sluggo is presented properly on the on the um, on the on the lure. So that's how you do a sluggo. Um, the, the other way you do a sluggo, believe it or not, is a weedless way. In the weedless way, do not cut off the head, okay? Because I'm using a weedless hook, and it's a little complicated, but we'll get into it. There's an S curve in the in the in the hook. So I go to the top of top of the uh, the sluggo, bring it down, bring it through. So I'm at this position here. And then I'm going to bring it all the way up, slide it through, and then I'm at this position and I have, I have to bring it back through the body and I watch what happens. And sometimes when you're in Nantucket Sound Side, you see a lot of, as the season kicks in and say like July, you might have seaweed, but look at that. It doesn't catch on anything. Okay. That's a weedless pattern. And you can use weedless patterns in the ponds too. Do you have to use them in the pond? You don't have to, but you know on the Cape Cut ponds in the summer when all the lily pads start to form? Yeah. Okay. I'll use a lizard weedless pattern. It's one of my favorite patterns. And this is weedless. And this is a salamander. Mm. Here you go. Do they um Wait, 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 wait. This one I left a little line up. Do they ever take the sluggo? 
they'll bite fight it and nine times out of ten if you're using them they'll, they'll whip them and once you feel that the striper this in striper fishing once you feel a fish hit you have to set the hook mm -hmm. and all you do to set the hook is when i have when i made my cast and it's out there and i'm running mm -hmm. it back in and i feel i just raise my rod yes uh, and that sets the hook yes. so you can do hard set or so but that's that's the number one thing just raise your rod yes. and set the hook Tight lines, you guys ever hear that? Tight lines is very simple. It means that I'm being tight with my presentation from the lure all the way back to my hand as I'm reeling it back. Mm -hmm. And it's, if that line is tight, as soon as I feel the, the, the fish bite, I set the hook. Now, if I'm catching little trout, I don't have to set it that hard. I can just go boom, set it. If I'm fishing for tuna and they're 100 pound tuna, I'm doing one of these things and setting it really hard or something that's from the bottom. Like a rockfish that's 30 feet down or flounder, I got to set the hook hard. Um, okay, so let's talk about now. What, what was this one again? That's a salamander, but the reason we talked about it is because the weedless. So we we have oh. the weed we have the weedless sand eel, which is for salt, and but, then, but we have a weedless salamander, which would be for the pond. For the pond. So, okay. And and I like to use weedless a lot um, because it gets through the. Uh, the grass lines. Stripers love grass lines, by the way. The eel grass that you see in Pleasant Bay, or even in in, uh, in the in the two harbors down here in Osceola, down in Couture, or wherever, you'll see lots of grass. Stripers love grass, and we can get these weedless patterns right through that grass. All right, more soft soft plastics. These are little um, juvenile peanut bunkers. Okay, very popular on the Cape, and the hook is on the top. And here you guys can pass it around. This is a soft plastic with a with an S tail in the back. But that's a great yeah. Um soft plastics, uh, a peanut bunker, baby peanut bunker. Do you want a bunker? Peanut bunker, yep. Peanut bunker. Bunker could get big. Um, and then they and people call them pogies around here. But the baby ones they call them peanut bunker. But that's a soft plastic, but a different style of soft plastic. Because in the soft plastic, you're you're reeling it back and you're dancing it and you'll you'll get the feel of that yeah soft plastics are well, great yeah this is completely different from the type i use like the little yeah we'll, we'll get into some later fly things yeah i got i brought some flies okay so top water we'll talk about top water next because these are usually medium uh water like four feet down six feet down stuff like that but top water is, is a little different any top water lure will have a a face on it like this and when i'm bringing the top water i'm popping it on the top and it makes a splash and believe it or not when you go out on the beach and you're looking down the beach we'll get into beach strategy in a little bit as well but and you see the birds diving and all that the the, the game species um bluefish and stripers and false albacores and all that stuff that's out there are push, literally pushing the bait right out of the water. And so top water is very important. So all these top water lures that I use, and I love these small sizes, this is what the stripers eat. So these are all, you can see the, all the, the, these are all, you can see all the bite marks on the bluefish and the striper on these. So these are, sometimes they have a rattle on them. Here, that's a little rattle. So when I'm popping it, if there's a rattle, fish-like noise. <laughs> The lateral lines on a striper, okay? You see the lateral lines on that body of that fish? Those are, those are part of the fish's sensory perception and they can feel um, other fish um, and that's how they, they can feed, especially in colored water. They can feel a little crab that's, that's running around like 15 to 20 yards away, like a, and they'll, they'll be swimming up, the, up, up on the sand and if they hear a little scurrying over there or if they feel it through their body, that'll hone them in and they'll go eat the crab. So that's very important. And that's why rattle and sound comes into play because it's sonar. I thought, it was a, I yeah. thought fish didn't like noise and that you need. No, that's how they feed. Had to be quiet. <laughs> yeah. You have to be quiet in the sense where you don't want to be, if you're in a pond, you don't want to be stepping over fish because sometimes the fish are right close. Same thing with brass lines um, in the estuary because I don't, my shadows, the sun's behind me. I don't want to have the sun and my shadow go forward. So I always make a couple of casts 
close to where I'm going to fish and then I'll move my way out. So I'm never stepping over anything. Um, so that's kind of the, the reason why they're saying be quiet all the time. Don't, and when I walk, I do one foot and then I'll do the next foot uh -huh. and then I'll wait. The other thing about jetties, I'm like, if I'm looking up at the, at the, at the beach line, I always want to make my cast like this. So I'm going to cast and move like 10 feet and, and cast and move. I don't stay in one spot. Okay, so I'll go up a mile up the beach and I'll come up a mile, but I'll work this, the sand on that type of angle. So always make your cast up the beach on an angle like this because you're showing the fish all lure before you're showing them anything else. And that's most times I'll get on that angle. That's when they're striking and I'm not spooking them because they, they, can, they can see us and feel us and stuff. So um, that hopefully that makes sense. Now, medium divers, they have a lip on them. This is a Yuzuri, um, and this is very popular, but this is a mackerel pattern, you guys can see, but it, it has a lip on the front, and that helps the, the, the lure dive into the water. Okay. And so when I'm reeling it back, it's going to go like this and dive and dive and dive and get deeper and deeper. So that's why we use the lip. Um, so now you got the soft plastic, you got the lip, and you got the popper all together as one. Who, what fish wants that lure to dive? Any, any, all the fish. All if, if you're just you're just getting into a water column that is uh, a little deeper. So you're you're always searching for water columns uh, at different depths to try to figure out where the fish are. So Colorado and the ponds and the So go ahead and ask about the difference between the beach, the estuary, and the ponds. Let me show you a uh, a picture of um, of uh, how stripers act um, on grasslands. All right, I'm going to put this video. I, this is one of my clients, Robin. I took her out. There you go, I mean, you're on, fish on. You see, that? Really? see how close we are? Okay, but you have them. Yeah. See how, mm -hmm. yeah. You see how close we are? And that, so we're we're in one or two feet of water and she's she's a total beginner. And she casts There you go, I mean, you're on. That's how it looks. Really? It's just hit. Okay, but you have them. Yeah. See, I feel me, hit again. See, see that the striker is literally hitting her lure and we're only, um, all right, this is what it looks like on grass lines. Um, there you go. See the bait right here? I got bus and strikers all up along this bank. Boom. See that? See them all? That's what the strikers look like when they're, when they're little fish. They're pushing the bait right into the grass lines. And you see the squirrels? See all the squirrels? Boom. Oh, would you look at the Oh, man, that's perfect. That's what that's that's the action on the Cape, and that's any estuary in the Cape. We found it up to P Town. We have estuary after estuary after estuary. But be careful, you guys, when you're in the estuaries. Um, there's a lot of potholes, and you can hurt your ankles. So be very very careful in the estuaries. Well, um, other challenging thing, at least for me, is the stupid grass and my beginning. Absolutely. So that's why I like to just get out in the middle of the whatever where there isn't any. Well, okay, so I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It's just to me, it's harder, and I'm not that seasoned. All right. So you're you're like me. You know, why don't you check this visual out? We're gonna be doing something like this. I'm gonna see you in September. See you when the summer rays fade. All right. It's kind of a little funny thing there, but you. I can't cry in September. And you break my wicked heart. All right, so you're 
what, what that's, we're, we're trying to travel and go from jetty to jetty to jetty. We're not going to stay in one spot. We don't like the estuary. We stay in the beach. That's all. We look for birds and we look for, we look for signs to help us out. I can see where that would be easier to fish on the jetty. Yes, yes. But be careful, jetties are slippery. So, right. So you have to um, pay attention to that because I, you know, we all slip, you know, we all, we all do it. Um, but be careful. Felt sole shoes, believe it or not, felt. You yeah. get the boots, you get the boot, and it has felt on the bottom. That will help you on the slippery rocks. Mm -hmm. And they sell them at Dick's Sporting Goods uh, in right near Hyannis. Oh. And we can go talk to Mike, who's the Mike, Mike's the manager, and they have a beautiful fishing department at Dick's. And so does Sportsport in Hyannis is another good one. Uh, Sportsport here um, as well. But felt's only legal in salt water, right? I you know, that's a good point. Some states, because you're going to be carrying the, the New York bacteria and algae for felt, they get a little, you're right. Oh, who would have thought of that? That's for fresh water. You're for fresh water. I, you know, I don't know the rules of mass right now, but that's a great point. But yeah, you're right. Um, okay, so I had an older gentleman that I, that I was out with, and he's, he wanted to catch a striper in the um, uh, in the estuary, and let me show you a little bit of, of him casting, and he was successful. Um, and he he the guy, um, he had a little uh, you know he got he 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 can't walk far you know. So when I take the client out, I'll take him to, to positions that that are helpful. There he is. I watch him cast. That's his cast. Okay. I watch the fish hit. Uh, okay. Fish on him. So this was Al, and he's got set up similar to this, but there he is. And He's got a striper on in the estuary, and it's only like like this much of water. And there it is, it's a striper. Right, so that's you get the you get you get the gist of it a little bit on. Uh, on what to expect when you're when you're making your casts. Um, okay, so are there any questions? We'll take a five minutes. Are there any questions right now? That is anything like really hitting you? Go, oh, I need to know about this. Anything? Okay, well. Yeah, so come on. You guys want to come well, on? Touch and touch and touch. See you. You don't do this business. All right. Well, let's we'll talk about that for a second. <laughs> you don't strip. What's the term? Now uh, stripping, that's for fly fishing. Yeah. All right. We'll get into fly fishing in a sec. But okay. let's let's talk about what it's gonna feel. Um you're doing see. a fly fishing cast. Right, that's different. I'll show you that in a second. But, but isn't that the same cast that you're doing with that rod that you just did? No, no, it'd be different. Fly fishing is very different than <laughs> okay. okay. Go ahead. I'm from another country. I'm sure. Dallas. I've been here for one week. My name is Anna. Okay, and uh, I would like to know if I can. For sure, I, I'm not going to buy something like this because I have to go come back. Okay. But can I rent some? Yes. Oh, okay. You can rent. Uh, I believe Harvard Sports Tackle rents, oh, okay. and I think we at Riverview rents also. So you can rent the right. Okay. First of all, my English is not very oh, okay. Good, so because I speak Spanish. <laughs> okay. Uh, hablo espanol poquito, me llamo Miguel. Oh, <laughs> right. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's let's do this. Just hold that and and walk to the room. Walk. Just walk. Keep going. This is my drag. Go ahead and pull it. That's called the drag on the line. Okay. Now, if I set the drag a little tighter, feel it. You can feel it. Yeah. It's getting tighter. All right. When when I make my cast and you're out as a fish and I just lift my rod, 
that sets the hook. You see the pressure, the sensor, yeah. you know, that'll set the pressure. Now go ahead and run. Yeah, now go this way. If I'm on the boat, I have to do this position. See how I switch my arm and I go this way? Yeah. Now go the other way. <laughs> Fish on. All right, now, see, now I'm going to move them up. Because if I lose, if I leave the pressure off, what's going to happen is they call it spit the hook. The fish could spit the hook. Now, if the fish comes, come, where at? look what I'm doing with my rod. I'm, I'm using, I'm going backwards with my tension. And he might come all the way up and see now look at the position I'm at and the, the fish is right here. Okay, so I kept the pressure on him. So if he's spinning, if he's going this way, my rod's going like this. If he goes right, I'm going to go like that. Always keeping the tension because I have him, I have him home. Really important. So you'll learn that. Everybody wants that. But if you keep it all loose, he can tend to spit the hook out. He or she. All right, so. So that we got a little, we did, we did surf casting. We did a little bit of lures. Um, we, uh, in the ponds, see the little baby herrings? Uh, these are Yosuri pins minnows. These are very popular. And I catch all kinds of fish on this little lure in the ponds, the Yosuri pin minnows. I love little spoons, Thomas Boyans and stuff like that. These catch the trout and they do very well. What are those? Uh, Thomas Boyans, they're called. Oh, yeah, and then believe it or not, I get into the soft plastics with the little little wormy guy. They really like this. And the leech. The leech pattern is really good. Yeah, so. And the Thomas Boyan? Yep. Yeah. And they, those are for trout. Dude, it's like a little fish. Huh? <laughs> a pair of earrings. Okay. Yeah, they're small. They're very small. Yeah, small little stuff. I'm getting my fair wife. Yeah. Oh yeah, these are for you. They a, a lot of jewelry makers are are are, are, are like fly tires and lure makers. They're they're very good with their in their hands. That absolutely. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they use the. So, in in fly fishing, we're using. Animal hairs and feathers of birds, exotic species, and all kinds of stuff, and fly fishing. Um, and that's a whole art form in itself that's been around for eons. Um, and you can go to artisans and make you tie and get into that. Like, here's some of the plot. You guys can look at some of the guys up here that we use. All right. So, yeah, there's some, there's some flies. Okay, here's a fly rod setup, you guys. So, four piece fly rod setup. And what I'll do is I'll take, hey, you guys can come on. It comes with the, with the rod and the reel. Um, so, and the line, the line has to match the size of the, of the, um, of the, uh, of the reel. So it goes from like three up to 15. And then, so what I do is there's a, there's my leader. All right, here's the little trick. When you bring one out from the winter, this is called the tripping line. From your from your, your position, but if you want to bring your thing out and you got this going like this, right? Watch this little trick. I just put the heat through my hand like that, and I'm straight. That's called straightening your leader. And look what happens. All right. So there's your straight leader. I can do the same thing with my fly line, okay? Because the cast, the fly, the fly is going to end up going like this. Yeah, that's called the turning over of the fly. So when I tie the fly on here, I'm making my back cast and my front cast. You know, and I'll show a video of that in a second. But this is what it's going to look like. It's going to turn over and go right like this. So, see it turning over? That's the that's called the loop in the, in the line. So every fly rod has a designation of a weight. You can look at it. Yeah, a weight. And a length. I mean, I've heard like you know, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, this was 19 or 924. No, nine foot. It's a nine foot. Nine foot. Nine, nine foot four piece. Four piece. So what's, so what's the number on it? Um, that's the little beam. Uh, it's the um, Imperial seven, nine foot nine, four piece, four nine, piece. nine weight. It's just the seven is there. That's the same chord on the same chord. All right, so when I want to put the line together, I'm sorry, the rod together, I got the two piece. So I'm always twisting it together. So 
the best way to do this is to go like this and and i'm going to twist it in all right slightly not too much pressure some people can put a little bit of um, um uh, rod guide wax in there if they want if not but here's now i'm into two pieces now i'm going for the third piece there's my third piece uh, obviously i'm doing that the 90 degree turn and then i'm going for my other piece here and now i've got my rod assembled and then i take my line from my, that's called stripping line from my reel i'll put a little like this i'll hold it like that and i'll just put it through so it's going through and now doing these are s um the little see it's got a little s in there and that helps the line shoot out uh, on the reel on the guides So you are, this is a floating line, right? So we have floating lines and sinking lines. Now, we, the floating line is best for? It's easiest to cast the floaters because it's light. So it's not necessarily what you're trying to catch. Yeah, the, the, the sinking line will sink in the current, maybe if you're on a rip or on a jetty. But again, remember we were talking about that balance before? Now you're looking for that balance in your finger, one finger, all right? So feel, feel it. That's your fly rod. You guys can feel it's a lot different and the cast is going to be different. Again, here we go on the flies. What do these look like? These are made from um, a guy in this, his, his company is called Saltwater Flies. And um, he's, he's from New Hampshire. And right, these are bucktail, but this is your classic sand eel. So the sand eel is the best. These two flies are the best flies on the cape, as far as I'm concerned. Both sand eel patterns. This is, see how that hook is up? When I'm, I can dance this off the sand and, and stuff like that. Now this is hooked down. This is an epoxy fly, and this is a, a, a half, like a clouser style fly. Now you're using that in the surf, not in the pond. Um, well, large my bass will hit this, but these are these are the quintessential straight flies. I'm going to show you some. I'll show you in a second some pond flies. What's the minimum weight for a fly rod for salt water? Uh, seven. Seven. Um, but here's a dragonfly. This is uh, spun to your hair on the front, and this will pop on top of the water. They're all light there. Yeah, they're it's super fun. light because. In fly fishing, your your line is getting the presentation of your lure out. Not the, not the you're not casting the lure, the, the, the line is getting out. You see how light the fly fishing is? Now here's your leader material. Okay. And the leaders come in different sizes. And in this particular fly line, the the leader is matched to a loop to loop connection, right? But feel it. Now what time, let it go through your fingers. What's happening? Very warm. Then what, what's getting smaller? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because what's happening is you want a tapered leader for the fly because um very important. Now, if you're if you're if you're casting really big flies, guys will just use the, the thick stuff, but let it go through. Let's see, see how it tapers? It's taper leader. All right. So uh, sinking line or intermediate line looks like this, and usually you'll carry it in your backpack. You'll carry, you'll carry the two things, the two stuff. Oh, when you want to open up a reel, there's usually a little hook here, and then you just so if you have to, you get a tangle or whatever, it should open right up like that, and then you can kind of kind of deal with your deal with your leader a little better, and then go back in, but. So I open that up and now I'm going to pull the. Oh, so that's how we use Yeah, it's a loop to loop connection. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, like, let's say on a pond, you're, you're fishing and you're going for, they're eating what's landing on the top of the water. Yes. You don't want a sinker. Not at all. You want to, if, there, if you yeah. see, if you see the ring in the rise, bing, bing, yeah. bing. If you see the ring in the rise, you want a, a, floater, a floater, and then here's the flies that I use on the cake. They're very, very, very small. 
grasshoppers. Um, yeah. And mayflies right now, we're in May, all the mayflies are going on. But here's what a, a sinking one feels like. Oh, yeah, it's different. It's way it's a lot different. Now, this is a this right. So, how do you decide on a leader what weight you should be having to be? Okay, 20. All right, so if I'm here's a popper I'm weight, sorry. I'm going to use the um, oh, yes. but I'm going to use a bigger kind of for, for something that has a lot of wind resistance in it. So, when I'm trying to get that fly to turn over. It's the wind resistance, it's the current, there's all kinds of calculations that have to be adhered um, with that. Um, so six, six, uh, here's 20 pounds, you know? yeah. But you know, you know, I go light, you know, but again, here's a perfect example of, uh, um, it just came out, it's been sitting for a while, and this is very, very important to keep your lines. Just straighten it. Nice, yeah, straighten it, now straighten that guy. And then even, even, your, even your fly line, when you strip it off, this is called stripping, by the way. And straighten that. And straight, yeah, go like this before you start casting. You see, you see my hand, and I'll just straighten it out. It's a really good technique, really trick. It's a trick. Now, with all the blue fish you have around right here, do you have to use a heavier? Yes, you can use a lead. Uh, a, um, you can, they, they sell um, metal leaders for the blue fish. Sure. Yep. I don't use them because I usually feel like the blue fish gets, uh, at least, but don't, yeah, good point. Do not touch toothy critters. You guys. <laughs> use, yeah. your, use your forceps, okay? Because I keep these forceps with me all the yeah. time, and I can just go like that. And I can walk around, and I use these all the time, so I can go like this. I can reach down, get the hook yeah. out, and not hurt the fish. Get it out, and then let them go. Um, you here's you your taste. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I'll make sure that he's. Um, yeah, I won't. I won't. Yeah. Um, here's the journal. If you want to look at it, you can uh, hit it from the um, your iPhone or your, your phone. You can scan and we're going to read the journal. If you want. And here's the new whole. Here's the new whole Pennsylvania journal too, which is different. Um, and that's the river fishing. You might be interested in the river fishing stuff. Is it translate? Oh. All right. So all right. So let's. Um, Let's go back to the video and I want to show you the fly cast in action on the video. All right, you guys can stay, whatever you guys want to do. Thank you. So on a YouTube video, here is um, here's what the fly cast looks like. Fly fishing stuff, it's going to take you guys a while to learn it. Um, <laughs> but once you learn it, you, you've got it. What's your feeling about the Trout Unlimited camera? I've been a member of the group, the Deerfield Trout Unlimited, the Pennsylvania and the Bucks County chapter, and the Cape Cod Chamber uh, Trout. They do great service. Yeah, because I, at least I know for it. Yeah. Do oh, it. what a great organization. My friend Kurt Dieter, I went to high school with him. He's on the... Um, Kurt is part of Charter Limited. He lives out in like Colorado, I think. He wrote the black book on fly fishing. Yeah, yeah. Kurt, you ever see it? Yeah. He's going to be here. He might be here. Oh, the school, the cheeky school we fly, fly fishing tournament is here um, in June. It's going to be at uh, Blaine's place at the, uh, the West End uh, restaurant. So you can learn a lot about fly fishing. Which town is that? Which That's town? over in Hyannis at the Rotary, right at the Melody Tent. Oh, okay. It's and called Cheeky Fly Fishing. Cheeky Fly Fishing. Well, what is that like? A... It's a tournament, a striker tournament. Oh. Um, Schooly striker tournament. They're okay. coming here on that. And then the, the post party is going to be there. Um, all right. So, all right. Here's the, here's the, the here's what this, what, what the, um, the, the fly fishing for stripers looks like. The thing that's different about a Virgo vacation home, you always help the whole place. To... That's stripping. See, I'm stripping. and look at, look, watch the boom. Okay. That's the that's the that's the fish hitting. And now I got that strike rhino. So let's look at look, look at that again. So I'm using my left hand to strip the line. There's my cast. Coppers out there. See my left hand strip, strip, strip. I watch the boom, he hits it. 
And you're pulling up the same as you would if well, you were using the other one. Well, see how I got my, my lines are tight. See how tight my line is? And he's, if I don't keep the line tight, I'm going to lose them. All right, so let's look at that again. So I have a surface topper on, and I'm using my left hand to strip, to strip the, the here's the cast. Strip, left hand, strip, strip, strip. Okay, so you hit right on the top. And now I got them on. All right, so that's um, that's what it looks like. Done. On for fly fishing. Now you strip all the way to get them to the shore, or yeah, and then I'll battle them or whatever I have to do. Um, all right, so let's just go through the photo montage really quick on the on the on the cape. I'll just I'll just peruse this and I'll let you guys. If you guys see anything that that hits your eye or says I want to look at that, so there's fishing on a kayak. Obviously, that's fun. Um, different pluggers. There's there's the see how small that uh, see how small that fly is for that trout. You can see it right here. That's a little emerger pattern, and then that's the that's the trout. And then there's one of the Cape Cod ponds, and you can see how it looks. And so very very light. Here's a, here's the largest mouth bass uh, with a rattler a rattle trap being used. So that, that's kind of like what the ponds look like around here. There's two guys who are walking the beach. And in Chatham, you see right here, you see the cuts. That's directly the eastern facing Atlantic, where one mile, one half mile off the shore, uh, pelagic species will, will come. Sharks, tuna, you name it. There it is, right in Chatham. And there's Pleasant Bay, protected by um, the barrier beach, and there's two fly fishing guys walking on the beach, and you can see the barrier beach in the back. But if you look at the barrier, you see all those cottages? They're not there anymore. They're all gone, was, and there's there's no left. And that, I took that picture when I first got to the Cape like 20 years ago, and all those cottages were there, but the, they're just not there anymore. You know, um, so that's that was me. There's a um, me with a client, pleasant day. And the client's got a nice striper. There's a fellow that I took on the south side that's in uh, Harwardsport, and that's exactly what Hyannis Osterville looks like from the beach, exactly the same. And there's a guy with a blue fish with a fly rod at sunset. That's a good point. It's another good point. At sunset uh, and sunrise, great times to fish. First of all, nobody's on the beach, right? And secondly, the beach is all to yourself. And thirdly, that's when the fish like to, like to feed. Uh, so first light, last light. Remember that, especially in the ponds too. That's your, and I call that the perfect moment because it was the perfect moment. The guy was successful, and um, he got the thing. That's what it looks like in Katuit. There's a picture right there with a couple of guys on the jetty, and the one guy's helping the other guy out, and he's got a surf casting rod with him, and they're releasing a striper. There's Nosset Beach, and there's the. Um, Nauset is on the beach, and then beach fishing is completely different. Um, you're looking for gravel, you're looking for points. If you look down the beach, and you see some little point of land that juts out, or some little structure that you want to go check out. That's where the fish are. That's how you. That's kind of a whole other class. But reading a beach, um, there's tricks to it. Uh, but if you if you just want to learn the the, the 101 to beach fishing, look for birds. And I don't care if it's one little one little plover that dies, <laughs> one little one. He's telling you something. Sometimes you can go out um, on the beach and yes, where and I'll hear the, the plovers. The, and once you're out there a lot, they communicate with each other. Yeah. And when they get real chirpy, they're either they don't like you being next to their nest, or they're getting ready to feed, or they're talking to a, about the fox or the predator coyote around or whatever. But you can, when you hear them active, they're they're doing something. And sometimes when you listen to them, they're getting ready to because the fish are pushing bait up and they're going to go grab little tidbits of bait. Yeah. So listen to the birds, but don't listen to them too much because they might uh, they might think you're a little loony. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just be aware of your environment.
Okay, we were talking about ponds, and there's the Ring and the Rise. There's a very famous book called The Ring and the Rise. I think the guy's name is Mary, uh, well, Vince Marano, no, Marino, I think. Marano, Marino. But he wrote the book, The Ring and the Rise. And there's the Ring and the Rise. And what's happening is the trout is coming up on the surface film of the pond and feeding on whatever's hatching and match the hatch. That's the entomology term for uh, matching your presentation to whether it's a mayfly or a dragonfly or whatever it is. And we can be very, very small. Uh, we have midges, a lot of midges on the Cape Cod ponds, and they're very small. Blue Glory Nickerson? That's Nickerson State yeah. Forest. Yeah, that's Nickerson's. And there's the ring of the rice. You can see, the, you can see yeah. the, the fish right out there. And so we're fly fishing on it. And that's what a brown trout looks like in our ponds. How do you know what's hatching? Where can you go? You okay? That's a great question. You you literally look in the water, and you literally get a little scooper out, or a little net, or whatever, and you start to learn um, the 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 life forms that are, that live in the ponds. They start in a in a um, egg stage that can be attached to reeds or attached to um, rocks on the bottom. When you see flies that are going on the top of the water, they're at their adult stage in life. And they're dropping eggs back onto the pond, What sometimes they, they fall to the bottom, and then they die. But when they're in, a, an, a, they're in like a caterpillar stage, and they'll explode out of their little, their little caterpillar stage. And while they're exploding, those are called emergers. And they're trying to form their wings, and they're trying to get up out of the water. And so that's the emerger. There's an egg stage, the emerging stage, and then there's a, the last stage is when you see on the top. So once you learn, hundreds and thousands of different type of bugs that are out there. And that's what fish eat bugs. They'll eat salamanders also. They'll eat little uh, crayfish um, for fresh water. You know, they'll eat beaches. Um, you see a dragonfly that's flying around the top, the, the larval stage of a dragonfly, and that's important for rivers, um, are called the helgermite, the helgermite which is important. Uh, small at bass love helgermites. Okay, there's a triple, there's the triple header right there. Um, that was these two, these two guys came from France, and um, they're they're they were fishing show people, and uh, it's a pêche pêche à la moche, and they have the and they came and we took them and chat them and they rented our boats and then that. But that's that's a good. Uh, the reason I like this picture because stripers go in pods, and they'll go up in groups of six to say eighteen of them. And they're that they use themselves in pods to attack other fish to protect themselves from other predators. And um, you can see um, when you're fly fishing with your buddies, it's not uncommon where you get a triple head, double hookups, and triple hookups all at the same time because your the pod came through. Yeah. And they're cruising, they're cruising around. So you that's the that, um, that's very important about triple because you have to go find them. You know, you, you know where, what are they doing? You know, you got to figure it out. But those are um, those were some fancy pants uh, French guys from a TV show. <laughs> this is the uh, Brewster Flats on the left, and there's us out on the kayak. Obviously, we got to watch out for tide. Be careful uh, because if you walk out onto any flats on the Cape, the water is coming behind you. And before you know it, you got you got ten feet behind you, and people every year people drown. So that's. Be very careful, and it's good. The first couple of times when you're out that far, you can see that we're out really far, and it's getting dark, and we've got to watch out for the fog and all that other stuff. But you know, bee buddy fishing is really good. There's a little little striper on the fly. You can see that little sand eel pattern we're using. Um, there's the canal. Okay, there's you can see that's on the beach up in Sandwich right here. And you can see that they're 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 slamming, they'll they'll push the bait right up to the yeah. right up to the beach. And you're looking for that, you know. Here's the kayaking, guys catch them in the kayaks. Um, and there's the man right there, this man right here, the chemistry professor. He's from Canada. He came down from Canada and he's literally a chemistry professor. So he's an interesting guy. Uh, I think he, he teaches at McGill, he just teaches McGill University, but Here's his the slug. We were just talking about the slug a little while ago, and here's his uh, his uh, standard surf setup, and he's got a little schoolie with him.
Um, there's, you know, we already talked about that a little bit. There's a guy with his first stri uh, striker on the, on the fly rod. There's, that's how we do the bites. So when we're going bike fishing, we uh, have baskets in the front, our Nantucket style baskets. And we put our lures and stuff in the basket in the front and then we'll have our, have our rods out the back so we can bike anywhere we want, uh, which is a really fun way to do it. Uh, here's the Kennedy Jetty down, um, down in Hyannis. I call it the Kennedy Jetty because the compound is kind of near there. Um, okay, here's flats fishing. This is Gordo, uh, Gordon Haight. He's from Doylestown and he's a really good fly fisher. And I think he lives on Nantucket now, but this is a man, this is Gordon on the, on the bow of the boat. Okay, and he's fly fishing. Um, and you can see how shallow the water is. Okay, and on the flats, he, we're, we were fishing a river within, within the ocean. So we call those sloop waves as well. So when the tide comes in and comes out, the stripers are gonna be in certain areas more than they're gonna be in other areas. And once you learn their patterns, you're more successful. On this day, when Gordon caught that big fish, um, there was football fields of stripers going to our left and to our right. And we just, one time we just like put the anchor down on that little flats boat and they would come, the stripers would come up to the boat and be around us for hours. But what's it then to put there wouldn't hit anything. So when they want to feed, they want to feed, but if they do not want to feed, yeah, have you seen that? Like that? Yeah, way too soon. And it's way too soon. You could cast the fly <laughs> off in their nose and they will not bite it. But when they're turned on, they're turned on. And it's amazing like that. But it's fun to watch them too. Um, but there's a that's the classic on your boat. He's making his fly cast. It's not that much fun to watch that. <laughs> yeah. Oh um, yeah. Um, but that's uh that is fun. That's on that's the next side. Uh, that's the inlet at Stage Harbor to the left. Some kayak. All right, so I'm on the, uh, I get the balancing act right here, and I've got a bunch of bluefish patterns here in my in my tackle box. And then see, this is an interesting photo because the bluefish is spitting up the bait that he's was feeding on. So when I caught him using that white plug, he's regurgitating his bait, and I've got the bluefish who has teeth, right? And so I'm putting the bluefish in my lap. And at the same time, I don't want to get bitten. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there and he's, I got my forceps. I've got the bluefish that's chomping. I've got my tackle bag and I've got current. All right. And I'm in, I'm on Pleasant Bay and I'm at near the mouth of the open. So things are going on all around me. I, I literally have a seal behind me. Yeah. Come around, I'm not, yeah, they come right behind you. And so the balancing act, you got to get them out of there and get them and move and don't let the seal get mad at you because they're like 700 pounds. And what's underneath the seal? Shark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Circle of life. <laughs> that's literally where, yeah, that's where the. And you didn't knock your tackle block over in the water either. If, you're right. Yeah. You don't want that. Like was ready to go. No, you don't want to lose hundreds of dollars with a tackle or a thousand or anything like that. Um, okay. So can you, I'm just curious. Can you get. Uh, can you catch bluefish on a fly line? Absolutely. Can you just bite right through it? No, because because I'm 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 pinning them in the side. Okay. Mostly. But you can buy. Like, away from the teeth, actually. Yeah, you can buy little leaders that that attach to the end. Oh, okay. Um, I don't use them myself because, but a lot of guys do because I feel like the fish can see the leader, uh -huh. the the metal leaders. But um, there are a little piece of wire that you can attach on the end. Okay, so that brings up a point with with bigger stripers and bigger bluefish as it pertains to leaders. I'm always using the tapered leaders because um, I'm usually catching the fish, like, but, I'm, but I'm into the alligator bluefish and I'm into the 30 pound stripers. Oh, guys will just use straight mono about this long. Okay, and they might say 20 pound test, 30 pound test. That's all they'll use and they can get their fly turned over and present it that way for the larger fish. The only difference between that, we were just talking about on the Brewster Flats, remember we were talking about the large 20 pound fish that are coming by, they see everything, all right? And they're really good. So what's your, what's your decision? Do you go with a heavy leader 
to get the bigger fish and to turn over a bigger fly and all that jazz? Or do you stay with a very, very small place presentation that's very, very light and the, uh, the, the, the monster keeper striper still will eat this and you'll fake them out. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta figure out what you're gonna do. <laughs> All right, so this is um, the, the, you know, the guy with his, uh, with his client. He's got a bunch of different rods that he's got with him. And see the little basket there? That's important for fly fishing. That basket sits on your belly and you can put your line in it when you're bringing your line back. And that's with line management. That's called a stripping basket. There's a, one of that's at Riders Cove in um, in Chatham. That's a, a you know a bluefin tuna that that guy caught and took him like five hours to bring it in. Okay, herring runs. That's what the herring runs look like on the Cape. Uh, see the, the man's hand right here. That's what's happening right now on Cape Cod and all the herring runs. So those herring are coming up up the runs. Up into the ponds, and there's a large amount of bass with the sound. We were talking about the salamander pattern earlier, and see how that hook goes right into his mouth on the weedless. So, when he clamps down on the weedless pattern on the salamander, the hook opens right up and will set right in the side of his hand. So, that's what that looks like. Um, and there's the herring, obviously, very important. The herring are protected species. I remember when we were kids, you can net the herring in the runs um, back in the Cape Cod, you can't do that. There's a sea robin on the jetty, like a rock bass. There's a big alligator bluefish. And we're laughing because we were trolling plugs on the sailboat and catching bluefish and albacore from the sailboat. Uh -huh. So that was just fun. You gotta be a good sailor. There's a beautiful, Pond, small one, um, on the fly. That was caught on black leech pattern. That's Brother Phil. He's one of our local musicians, but he's a really good fisherman. There's there's uh, Pete. He was really good fish. He's a really good musician as well. Um, that's a perch, by the way. He's got a nice little pond perch. But a lot of perch around here in the pond. There's Nina, and she's got a blue. Now he's got the blue fish on right now. And it's Nina and Brian. So this story right here, Nina, she's out in the kayak. She's got her lures up here. And see how the, the bluefish cut right through the sluggo? Yeah. Bit it right in half. And there's Nina, like, oh, my God, this fish has teeth. What do I do? <laughs> yeah, she's spazzing out. And this was a little bird called Brian. And uh, Nina's like, and they hover over the kayaks. And Nina was like, Michael, she's like, that bird is talking to us. I'm like, and so it's a funny story, Brian. But we're listening to the bird, and that's Nina. And so she's she's listening to the bird. She's she's on the kayak and she's trying to fight the bluefish all at once and not get bit by it. <laughs> there's there's an estuary. That's like five in the morning. Little Chad. He's got his Red Sox jersey on, and he's uh, he's got his first striper and his striper bigger than him almost. And then there's a kayak in the estuaries. All right, grass lines. Okay, grass lines very important. We were talking about those earlier, but there's the grass lines in anywhere on the Cape, and there's the lateral lines of the striper. And the reason the grass lines are important because the stripers come and hub up along the grass lines because they don't want to be eaten by the seals. Oh. So their natural bodies are have lines in them, and, the, and if you look at the colors, stripers will change colors. If if they're in the grass, they'll be darker. If they're on the sand, they become lighter. And they can become real blonde in the sand, so which is really neat. They do change colors like chameleons um, to protect themselves. But you can see the grass lines as you as you look up, and the tide's coming into the grass line and filling it up. Here's your seal, right? Okay. So that's I took that picture right off of the um, right off. Of, they come right up to your boat, so don't don't be um, don't be scared. This is when I was younger and I had hair. But this is, that's Samantha Brown from the Travel Channel. And we had her on our phone. I don't know if you know, she's got all kinds of really cool um, she, uh, TV shows now because she travels and stuff. But that was here with her on the boat. And that was me. That was way back in the 2000s. And she's still got a great show. I 
think the guy that owns that does Shark Tank, O'Leary, Kevin O'Leary, I, I think he sir, owns part of the travel shop. Uh, yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. So on the left is a box of flies um, that I like. And obviously, here's the sand eels. These are pink because of squid. Squid is a really good color. And then I like the yellows and the olives. Yellow, bright flies on foggy days show up really nice. So it's foggy out. You wear amber sunglasses and bright colored lures. So bright colors lures will be your chartreuse, your yellows. That's, that's for foggy days. On sunny days, switch to natural. Okay, very important because if it's too bright in sunny days, the fish are not going to like it. So we got to pick on sunny and bright. Um, there is your stripping basket, and the stripping basket goes here. So when I'm taking my line with my stripping basket and I make my cast, um, I'm making my cast out there. I'm going to be stripped. Here. I touch the back of my stripping basket, and the line lays in here. And then when I go to make my next cast, I cast it out, and all that line will shoot out. From my basket. Now, the only time I'll use that is if I'm in a structured area where I think my line's going to get caught up in my feet in the jetties or something like that. Yeah. Or uh, because, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with. I use a Nantucket basket too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that's yeah. a bad way to do it. Um, okay. Again, there's, there's a picture of. Um, the the the, the, um, the the cottages that are not there anymore. You know, you look in the back; those cottages have all been washed away. Okay, there's a guy on the jetty, and he's got he's got a you know he's got a striper that he just caught. Okay, very important. All right, what am I looking at right here, you guys? Birds. 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 Right, and. We'll... <coughs> What's happening? That's bluefish slamming bait, we're coming right, jumping right out of the water. Large bluefish. That's what you're looking for. So, all right. So we're, right now we're we've got the inlet going out. We've got the tide that's ripping in. We've got the bluefish going. We have to navigate all of that at once. We have to plan what we're doing. We have to be safe about it. We have to have our life jacket. We have to have our whistle. And we're right in the mix of it, aren't we? All right. And so it's, you have to pick your moments and feel comfortable. If you don't feel comfortable, don't do it. You don't have to. Even if you're with a guy and you don't feel comfortable and you don't want to be out there, um, you, you don't take, back off, back off. Do you take your kayaks out to the rips? Yeah, that's, 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 in play. that's, that's moving water. We're moving quick. A, a tip of water? Uh, yeah, but we're, wow. yeah, but we're, we're that's riding, right. the, we're, 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 we're riding the current <clears throat> and we're planning, we're, we're planning on an angle. We're going to try to get out there with the current and then we'll use the current to bring us back and not try not to fight it and plan it correctly. Um, or that. sometimes we'll have boats. <laughs> you have a sea kayak with like we'll have sea kayaks, yeah. Do you yeah. sit more in it than on the I, I will you always on top. Oh, yeah, okay. you, know, you should never be fishing in a kayak that has any skirt or anything like that. Right. It's just a recipe for disaster. Um, but we can also bring the boats. Put the kayaks into the boat and bring you down a monomoyer, and then have the boat shuttle you back and forth. That's not that's not a smart way to do it. Too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's true. Okay, there's a great white shark right off of Dave Roddick's boat, right off of Chatham. So, okay, let's talk about sharks and seals for a second, and and, and fishing. There are so many times off of boats when you're reeling the striper or the or the albi or the tuna back to the boat, the shark will come up and take it right right from you, right off the boat. Because you have the striper on your line or the bluefish and it's suspended and it can't do what it normally can. It's easy, uh, easy for the the big predators to come up right to your boat and take your striper. So there's a great white right off of his boat, and that it does happen a lot. Every every captain that I know. Has had that happen. It's happened to me on the kayak with the seals. Um, they come and take your striper uh, right, right when you're bringing it in. Again, there's the stripping basket uh, with a nice striper. Um, 
We're burning steels. Oh, okay. There's, there's your felt. Okay, there's the felt that we were talking about. Very important, and that protects you from slipping on the rocks. Now, if you're on a jetty, I work the jetty like a clock. So 10 o'clock is out this way, 12 and 2. So when you're working the jetty, your first cast will be here before you walk up to the jetty, maybe do a couple casts here, do a couple casts here. Then I walk to the jetty where these birds are, do a cast there, do a cast there. When I'm on the tip of the jetty, I go 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. So I've just made eight casts. If I don't catch a fish in eight casts, what do I do? Move on. I move on to the next jetty, exactly. And that's how I catch them because We'll go from jetty to jetty to jetty on the Cape. And if you, if you did 10 of that, and that's your 100 casts, 10 jetties down, you got to run into something. So that's very important. Work the clock on the jetty. Uh, a lot of people don't do that. Is there a certain direction you should go in? Because you don't want to also have the chase racing down in the opposite direction that you're casting and walking. All right. That's a, okay, great question. Now, if I've got wind, Say this is a south side jetty and the wind's always coming southwest, right? And the wind's coming like this. And I want to get my fly to be cast this way as much as possible. I'll be making a cast like this. And sometimes I'll do one of these and I can throw the fly up way high and let that wind take that fly in the hole out that way. If I'm casting into the wind, the southwest this way, I have to bring my cast down and do a cast like this. All right, so I'm bringing my, my presentation, my cast is kind of like one of these, and I'm going shooting through the wind low to get it under the wind. So two different things on the jetty. Um, but don't overthink it. Don't overthink the jetty too much because just get out there and try to hit those positions and you'll be successful. And, and, be, and you, here, I'll show you, I'll show you a video of, of the jetty um, where the stripers are right up on it. Um, and uh, and it, it, they're big too, and they come right up to your jetty. As we're talking about, because I love jetty fishing, it's fun. This is a south side jetty also, but you'll see the big stripers come up. As long as you work the clock on the jetty, you'll be, you'll be, um, you'll be successful. All right, here's a pot of stripers feeding right in front of me. I used to think all socks were the same, and then I tried bombas, and now I've convinced every single person in my life that they're the best. Good. Just like that. Yeah. Right there, see all that black. All that gray stuff. All that gray stuff. It's just spinning on the stripers. Barely see them, but that's, that's what it's going to look like. He's on. Uh, I'm getting let's, let's look at that again because it's they're only in a foot of water. Right there, right there. See the micrometer is it's all stripers in there and big fish. Look at that. There you are. That whole ball right there. And the see one right there, so like right there. See them? That, that, see how they blend in? They're very, they're very translucent. They just went right in. How many did you say is in that pond? I was eighteen of them in that pond. Huh. Yeah. So that's 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 kind of what it looks like on the from the jetty position. Great one to think, but when you are looking for. All right, so that's um, a little bit about um, the, uh, the. So you got the video, a little bit of the video. You can always go back to the video on the traveling angler and look at it if, if you want. You can look at here's. Um, one of our books, 
Um, you can take this. This has all the 18 charter captains in our, our book. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so take one of these in YouTube. Uh, any questions? Um, you have my email. What about licenses? Uh, you go to Mass uh, Mass Fisheries on the web, and it's thirty dollars for fresh water, nine dollars for salt water, and it takes you thirty seconds, and you sign right up. Do you have a limit? Um, when you go on the Mass uh, Fisheries website, it has all the regulations and the limits for every species of fish in Massachusetts, and you can just look at it. And throughout the season, it changes. What is the predominant? species in the ponds around like around here like in just say off your goes um pickerel perch largemouth bass trout uh, the trout if they're stocked okay. the stocking of the trout yeah massachusetts they're actually doing it right now they're, yeah massachusetts has a great stocking program yeah. um there's brown trout tiger trout rainbow okay. trout yeah 